as a surgeon, uh, by the time you see me, it's usually after the diagnosis has been made, and so prevention and detection, while important at that point, play a little bit of a different role in the conversation that we have. And again, by the time you see me, um, you're um, basically, you have been diagnosed with melanoma at some point along the way, and um, as you can imagine, no one really consents to having someone take a knife to them unless there's something desperately wrong. And so by the time we're having a conversation, you're already willing to let me basically put you under anesthesia and cut you, and that's just a weird thing to think about. But um, as, as one of my colleagues once told me, there's really no problem that um, a good operation can't make worse. And so um, you'll see that the theme of this talk is, is not just about um, reducing complications from surgery, but the ideal way to do that, and I'll get to that towards the end. Um, I don't have any disclosures this morning. Um, and while Sufi gave you a rough introduction of what the problem with melanoma is, um, I'll characterize it a little bit more concretely. There's going to be a little over 80,000 melanomas a year diagnosed in this country. When you compare that to some other cancers, it doesn't sound like a huge number, but it is the only cancer that uh, might be alluded to, not just a dime, but less than a millimeter of disease can be um, really significant. Um, and while we don't necessarily think about that as reassuring, um, because it's not, the one thing that's really good about melanoma is that it occurs on the skin most commonly, and so usually you can find it when it's still very early, and so um, we often have a favorable, favorable prognosis. Most importantly, and this is not something I'm going to talk um, about significantly today, but most importantly, our concepts around cancer have changed dramatically over the past 15 years. One of the reasons why cancer is such a scary, um, one of the reasons why cancer is such a scary um, concept for people is that in, over you know, the past 100 years or so, cancer has been a black and white concept, that either you're going to be cured or you're going to die. And that's really a daunting concept to deal with as a patient, as a family member of a patient. Um, but, in fact, um, but in fact, it turns out that um, that's a wrong concept. That In fact, especially with the therapeutic interventions that we've developed over the past decade or so, and we still haven't told um, in the past decade or so, um, that concept is actually outdated remarkably, and that we can actually cre um, change cancer to a chronic disease. And if you think about it, nobody gets really scared when they're told, oh, you have high blood pressure. Maybe if you've had a really bad experience with it, somebody might. But if we can tell you that, oh, melanoma is just like having high blood pressure, that's a pretty reassuring concept. Um, and it certainly would be reassuring to many of you in the room who've suffered from therapy from this disease and the complications from it. But we're actually getting to that point where that goal is a very realistic one and a much more, much more attainable goal than cure versus, um, versus not. And so um, that's really important, and it changes the way we think about things, and it's why survivorship and complications and managing your life has become so important. So when you think about 80,000 cases of melanoma, um, it actually turns out to be about 2,500 cases a year in the state of Georgia alone. Bring, bring it out to, into the region, and then it goes up to about 8,000 cases in the region, including Florida. A little bit more than that, actually, if you include the, Northern, the North Carolina, South Carolina group as well. But it does remain one of the most rapidly increasing incidences of all cancers. And so a large function of that is that our sun behavior still is horrible. And in fact, uh, what Sufi was talking about is, is really um, reflected in the marketplace for sun protective clothing. If you go into REI or Target or Walmart, almost every sporting goods store has a marketplace for the clo clothing that offers sun protection. Personally, I find it much easier to deal with. If any of you have ever worn any of it, you know, you think, oh, it's got to be heavy and really bulky, and it's not. I, I fish a lot, and the shirts that I wear are incredibly cool. They're actually much more comfortable than even a cotton t-shirt. And so it's very easy to get now, and it's very comfortable. And so I really encourage those of you that have, um, you know, have outside behaviors or jobs to um, really invest in that. Um, and regardless of the new therapies, um, the old therapy still remains a huge part of what we do. And people have frequently said to me, well, now that we have ipilimumab or Pembro or all these drugs you've read about in the newspaper, what are you going to do? <laughs> Meaning what, what's left for me to do? But in fact, the truth of the matter is that um, I look at it very differently. I look at it now as the nature of the surgery that I do is going to change, but that surgery remains a significant part of the therapeutic armamentarium for melanoma because now that we actually have effective therapy, being aggressive surgically makes a lot more sense. And so more and more frequently, people will be referred for different and potentially more complicated operations than they were originally referred for because 
now we have a very realistic treatment paradigm that will include getting rid of what disease is left or what disease is not responding or um, any, any um, disease that seems like it's very focal. And so we really just change the way we think about surgery. So this is essentially a summary of the options that come up for treatment patient, for patients with diagnosis, right? So you're going to have surgical excision either by Mohs, if it's a very, very small lesion or in an area that's very sensitive, wide excision, which is what a, a surgeon will do for you. You may or may not need a sentinel node biopsy. If you have disease in your lymph nodes, you may be recommended for a surgical lymphadenectomy, which is basically the medical term for removing all the lymph nodes in an area. Um, we may remove metastatic disease, either for diagnosis or for treatment decisions. And um, you may, of course, and you'll hear later this morning, about treatment with all of our new drugs. Um, the truth of the matter is that all of these options are used in different situations. And so while you may read online, oh, this is what I should have or this is what I should have, it really depends a lot on your situation. There are a number of factors that go into the decision making around which recommendation, which therapy, therapy you're recommended to undergo. Um, and that continues to evolve as we learn more about the disease. So um, what I'm going to focus on mostly today is the risk of lymphatic surgery, because that is the surgery that has the most complication risk to a patient routinely undergoing care for melanoma. I will say that even wide local excision um, has its own set of risks, although most of them are self-limited. And I'll also say, um, as I said in my title slide, um, anytime we touch you, Anytime somebody does something to change your body, it certainly has its risk associated with it. Whether it be even drawing blood, there's always a little bit of a risk to everything. But in context, everything we do has a risk. And if we catalog those risks for you, and this is the way I can send patients for surgery, if we catalog the risks that you incur driving here today, you might never get in your car. Because the things that can happen on an Atlanta highway are pretty complicated. As you know, a bridge can fall down. And so, um, so we really have to keep that in mind. So the risks of surgical lymphadenectomy depend on where we're going to do the surgery. Um, there are different parts of your body. In general, we think of the conceptually, we think of three major lymph node basins, your neck, your axilla, which is your underarms, and your groins. And I'm going to talk about those three very, relatively um, briefly. So in the neck, you can have injury to a nerve. In the neck, that's the most actually concerning risk as a surgeon, because the nerve is very superficial and it's very small. Um, the incidence of that occurring is relatively rare, but it is the nerve, it's called the spinal accessory nerve, it allows you to shrug. So for those of you that know the trapezius muscles, if you are familiar with that, those are the muscles that make, basically make um, uh, football players not have a neck, right? So it's that big triangle that comes out of your, out of your ears sometimes, and that, that's what allows you to shrug. There's more to it, though. If you injure that nerve, the weight that's supported by, your, um, by that muscle is your shoulder and you tend to have shoulder droop, and it actually has a lot of significant side effects. And while after surgery, a lot of patients may have what's called a palsy, which is a temporary injury to the nerve, it's the injury to the nerve completely that is really chronically problematic and debilitating. Um, you can have a leak from the lymphatic system, particularly on the left side of the neck. All of the lymphatic flow in the body in, uh, goes into the internal jugular vein on the left side of your neck. And so when you do a surgical lymphadenectomy on the left side of the neck, there is a significant risk of having a lymphatic leak. What does that mean? In most instances, it stops on its own. So it's not a long-term problem. In some instances, we have to do some procedures to deal with it. And in very rare cases, we actually have to surgically reoperate to actually tie off what's called a thoracic duct. Um, you can have an infection. Nicely in the neck, that's very uncommon because the blood supply to the neck is very um, robust, and so we rarely have those problems. But um, you can have an infection anytime you have a violation of your skin. The skin is, a, um, is the best barrier to infection, and so um, the risk of infection goes up anytime we do any sort of intervention that violates the skin. I do want to take a moment and just take a little sidebar. There's a lot of, pub a lot of published um, in the lay press, a lot of talk about MRSA, and this tends to freak pe people out. Staph infections, strep infections, these flesh-eating bacteria. So everybody in the world has staph and strep on their skin. It's normal body flora. And with antibacterial soap and the use of antibiotics and things like that, there is an increasing amount of resistant bacteria. And you can read about those every day in the newspaper. The majority of people 
will get, if they get a skin infection, will have a strep or a staph infection. So just having a staph or strep infection does not mean you're going to have MRSA or a resistant infection. And so we have very routine antibiotics that are taken orally that get rid of almost every infection that we have from a skin operation. There are some, there are some people, particularly people who work in the healthcare field or who have children who, have, um, who, get routine, who get routinely exposed to kids who also have these infections and sort of thing, that increases the likelihood that you might have a resistant infection. Even those are most commonly successfully treated in the community with oral antibiotics. The best prevention for an infection is cleaning your skin well the night before an intervention, a surgical intervention. So the best way to do that is just buying a chlorhexidine soap from the um, drugstore and cleaning the area for the planned surgery or just taking a shower and using that soap. 24 hours before, it gets rid of all the bacteria on your skin or 98% of it and will reduce the likelihood of infection. And so much so that the CDC does not recommend for skin operations any antibiotic intervention at all. It does not predict or reduce the likelihood of you having an infection. Just a pre-intervention a pre, um, pre shower with an antibacterial soap. So that's important to understand. Um, seroma, when we operate, you've all heard the expression, nature abhors a vacuum, nature hates a vacuum. We create space. That cavity is usually obliterated by a drain. However, it doesn't always completely get obliterated. And when fluid accumulates, it's just clear, sterile serum, which is where the word seroma comes from. And that can often be managed with just observation. It'll go away. Your body will heal properly over about six weeks, and it'll go away. In some instances, it doesn't like to go away, and we have to drain it with a needle or even sometimes with a new drain. It just varies from person to person. It has a lot to do with your biology, and we can't predict who that is. We know everyone gets a little bit of fluid accumulating in a wound. It happens all the time. It's not actually a complication. It just happens, and the majority of the time, it goes away all by itself. But you should know that it can happen. Your clinician, if, it's, um, if they're not comfortable treating it, should refer you to somebody who is. But most people who do this type of surgery should know how to take care of that. It's very... Um, it's very common that it occurs, but it's very rare that it's a problem. Um, wounds can fall apart. Again, um, the people who built you best are your mom and your dad, and your surgeon is not going to put you back together exactly the way you were born. We try very hard to make it as good as possible, and what's remarkable is the human body is designed to heal. It's designed to heal. And so even if we left you wide open, which is often an option we have to choose for certain wounds in certain parts of the body, your body will heal that. It may take a long time, and it certainly will not be something you want to be patient waiting to happen, but your body will heal it. And so it makes us look good, because even, all we have to do is get skin next to skin, and you magically make us look like we know what we're doing. All, we, all we're really doing is letting your body do what it's supposed to do. But that said, there are things that interfere with that. Sometimes it's, um, it's infection. Sometimes it's um, your, your um, activity level. And sometimes I blame it on, on Dr. Kuchikar, Dr. Lawson, and Dr. Ushak and it's the therapy that they give you that makes it not heal. But in general, this can happen. It can go from any very superficial to a very deep breakdown. But they're all things that are very manageable. They're not life-threatening. They're cosmetic, mostly. Sometimes they can impact your range of motion. And then cosmesis. If a scar doesn't heal properly or if we take out a bunch of stuff and it makes your body look concave or a little bit exaggerates some of the, um, some of the contours of your skin. And you know, now that we're talking about people really being cured with this disease or living a long period of time, cosmetics actually plays a bigger role than it used to be. Now, I get away with a lot because when people come to me, it's often because they feel as though this is a battle between life and death. I walked into a patient's room this morning, and she told me I was her hero, and I said all I did was what I was trained to do. Right? But in many ways, that's the way people, people give me a pass, meaning you heal in whatever way you heal, and you don't care how you're going to look for a while. But after you've gotten through the acute event of realizing that, okay, I'm past that, then the way you look does matter. And so we do really, as surgeons, try to make you look as good as when we found you. Um, it doesn't always come out as well as we'd like, and so we recognize that. And we have a team of plastic surgeons here who, after you're through the acute therapeutic phase, will be happy to revise scars and that sort of thing if it's appropriate and something you really want to do. So this is the neck. Now I'm going to show you a similar list for the underarm. It's slightly different. I'm going to add one thing to it. And that's the axilla, right? So the axilla, same thing. You can injure some nerves. You can have a lymphatic leak. You can have an infection. You can get a seroma, which is actually a little bit more common in the axilla. You can have the wound fall apart. And then 
you can have um, an axillary web or a frozen shoulder, which means if you don't use your arm after surgery, it'll stiffen up and stay in place, or you'll get a scar and a band underneath your arm. Both of those things can happen. The best way to avoid those is by motion. And then the last thing is you can have lymphedema. Unlike breast cancer, where lymphedema is a big problem, for after melanoma surgery, it's much less common. At this institution, our incidence of lymph lymphedema is about 1.3% after axillary dissection. Nationally, internationally, it's about 4 or 5%. After breast cancer, it's about 20%. The reasons for that are complicated and don't matter for us, but lymphedema is a big problem. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more in a second because in the groin, it's much more common. So in the groin, again, you can get a wound infection. It's really common to get a wound infection. You can get the wound falling apart, also common. The groin is a really bad place to have, a, have an operation, and it's a really bad place to have a big open cut, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, you can get an infection, like I said. I've said it twice, actually. That's how common it is. Um, you can have a seroma. You can get the flaps of your surgery to fall apart and die because the skin gets thin. Um, and you get lymphedema 20 to 25% of the time. That's a lot. And it's significant when your leg weighs like 5 pounds more than it should, or 10 pounds more than it should. The risk factors for any of these complications, they're actually age, if you're in the very elderly range, above 75. If you smoke, smoking is very bad. If you're overweight, you have an increased risk of complications, particularly in the groin. Um, and the amount of disease you have. So if you have big, bulky disease, you may have more complications from surgery, which is why we try to intervene early. Right? This is bad disease. There's nothing that can, that can replace surgery here, um, although nowadays some systemic therapy may, but this is a problem because it's going to bleed and ulcerate and be problematic. Right? But these are different kinds of wound complications. This is a superficial infection. This is a dehiscence. Okay? This is a dehiscence on the left. This is flap necrosis. Oop, that didn't work too well. On the right. So this is where the flap starts to die. Um, and you can see this dark area on the skin. The incidence of lymphedema after cell node biopsy is largely talked about, but after melanoma, it's relatively rare. And then these are the numbers that I just started to give you. In the neck, it almost never happens. All right? If you have to have your pelvic lymph nodes removed, it does increase the incidence of lymphedema by a little bit, but not so much above groin. Groin surgery alone is a pretty big risk factor for lymphedema. What does lymphedema look like? This is mild. Okay, this is moderate, and again, it's not the size of the leg, but it's the size of the leg compared to the other leg, so this leg versus this leg, of course, okay? This is severe, okay? And that's, that's the spectrum which I can't predict before I do surgery. So when I talk to you about the risk of lymphedema, this is what I'm thinking about in my head. And so what can we do about that? Well, there's first the risk factors, obviously having the pelvic lymph nodes removed as well. If you get an infection after surgery, if you have to have a large segment of skin removed, if you have vascular disease to begin with, if you have a very thick melanoma because we have to take off more skin to treat that, those are all things that increase it. If you have a primary lesion on your extremity, and if you're obese, those are things that give you risk factor, that increase the likelihood of lymphedema. If you have a sedentary lifestyle, that increases the likelihood of you developing lymphedema because we know that activity reduces the incidence of lymphedema. Um, if you can avoid an infection, which is impossible to do, except for the fact if you try to, um, you know, like I said, if you can shower before surgery with a chlorhexidine scrub, that would be helpful. Um, if you can minimize the surgical intervention, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, we use radiation sparingly, and um, if you exercise after surgery. So activity after surgery actually reduces the likelihood of lymphedema. Management, um, basically, um, there's a number of different therapeutic interventions. We have a lymphedema therapist here. There's, there are a few lymphedema therapists around the city of Atlanta, and certainly there are several scattered about the state. Um, the Lighthouse Lymphedema Network actually has a, is a good source for um, counseling and support for people with lymphedema and resource allocation for that. Um, mostly it's managed by compression garments if it's mild, um, but you can get um, pneumatic and mechanical devices for, um, for moderate to severe lymphedema, and there is actually here a plastic surgeon who does sur um, surgical reconstruction to reduce the incidence of complications after lymphedema therapy. Um, Dr. Angela Cheng is running our surgical lymphedema reconstruction service here. Um, there, the other thing to do, as I mentioned, is minimize surgery. So here at Emory, we created a procedure called the minimally invasive groin dissection, and it basically halves the incidence of complications after surgery in the groin. So if you have a wound it's one, that increases your, um, 
your risks of lymphedema and wound infection, the best thing to do is eliminate that wound. And so we've changed the approach to um, surgical removal of lymph nodes from the groin, and we do it through a scope in most instances. And in fact, you see that there's a remarkable decrease, although um, um, <clears throat> the, the best way to avoid uh, complications is potentially to not do surgery at all, and we're going to get there in just a moment. This is what happens after an open operation, and this is after a video operation. Um, this is in the same patient. We did one side open for, one, for, a, different, for a clinical reason, and one side um, minimally invasive. You can see the difference in his recovery from surgery from his right side to his left side. And so that's the best, that's the best comparison picture I can give you. Same patient, bilateral groin surgery. Um, there are sometimes some unexpected complications. This was actually um, a scar from using a warm compress. The patient was numb over the area of the surgery and, and burned themselves by using a warm compress, not realizing that they just burned themselves. So there are some unexpected complications that occur from surgery as well. But like I said, the most effective way to reduce complications from surgery is just don't do the surgery. And so um, while that sounds a little funny, um, I would say to you that we're at a point now where there's a lot of um, opportunity to visit whether we need to do surgery or not. The therapeutic options from our medical oncology colleagues. There are two trials that just got published. I'm not going to get into detail with them because the trial data is not that important. But the bottom line is, actually, I will show this. What I want you to see is this up here. Okay? What this is is if you, melanoma specific survival. The likelihood that you're going to survive without a recurrence of your melanoma, essentially. Okay? Whether you have all your lymph nodes removed or you don't have your lymph nodes removed. And everyone in the room can see that they're almost identical. Okay? And, and what ultimately that means is that this. In patients with minimal disease detected by sentinel node biopsy, it turns out that if we don't take out all your lymph nodes, we actually may have the same outcome as if we do take out all your lymph nodes. And while this is a very complicated topic that we don't have time to get into this morning, what it basically means is that it's okay to not have all your lymph nodes removed in certain situations. And so these considerations are important and they're individualized, but they are an option for you. And so what I want you to take away from this is basically this. The best way to avoid surgical complications is just not to have the operation. And we now actually have that option. But some people do require surgery still, and it's still very important to consider that as an option, especially if your doctors are recommending it. Smoking, obesity, and radiation therapy are probably the three greatest risk factors for complications after surgery if you have to have surgery. But um, uh, if you do have to have surgery in your lymph nodes, it's usually going to be because you have actually a big lymph node that you can feel. And therapeutic lymphadenectomy, that's what that's called, has a higher risk of complications. And so I'm out of time, um, but if there are any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer them at some point later, or my partner, Dr. Lowe, can also do that too. Thank you, Virta. Uh, MSLT2, four months ago. Four months ago. Three months so ago. Those of you in the audience yeah. that have had surgery, like, why did my doctor do surgery? This is all changing. Yeah, it's, it's, actually, it's actually just came I mean, officially it was reported in July. Sure. So, so Dr. Dr. Kuchker said um, the study that I just presented, the MSLT2 study, was just published four months ago, actually less than four months ago, and I think about July. Um, and so if you've been recommended to have, if you've had surgery since in, before July of this year, that would be the standard of care until July this year. And even now, the consensus guidelines for recommendations about surgical intervention are based on age, the number of sentinel nodes you have positive, um, the amount of disease in your sentinel nodes. So not, this does not apply to everyone. It applies to some people. If you're being treated by a melanoma specialist, they will understand this, and they will have this conversation with you. I still recommend surgery in many patients, particularly younger patients, because the follow-up on these trials is relatively limited. And we know that the disease may come back in the nodal basin without affecting the overall survival, but may come back in the nodal basin. That has its own set of concerns. And so age and other factors, the amount of melanoma in your original biopsy, all those things play into it. But it is brand new data. I mean, you're actually getting cutting edge data that's just come out and is just now changing our approach to this disease. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time.